Welcome to another episode of Topical with Michael Schaefer. Something a bit different this week. I'm joined by Andy Curtin, who ran the first ever English-speaking comedy club in Shanghai, which was subsequently shut down by the government. People talk a lot about censorship in comedy these days, but this story, you got to hear. That's one small step for podcasts. One giant leap for comedy. We are stripped down and... Mate, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's good to be here, man. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear your story today because I just think the free speech and censorship is always something that people are talking about ironically but it's kind of been a very interesting discussion the last few days because Elon Musk has just bought Twitter and now we have a billionaire controlling uh, speech platform as opposed to before <laughs> yeah as opposed to before it was a Saudi when the, billionaire when the uh, homeless were controlling the uh, media platforms that we look at the homeless were controlling the media platforms. No, I mean, it was always a billionaire oh, control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, which is this truth social? I don't yeah. know. Which one's this? No, I mean, it's a different billionaire, sure. But but it's interesting how people are always worried about free speech and censorship on social media. And, you know, in particular, like I think conservatives and right-wing people have been complaining about it or worrying about it for a while. But I think it's interesting chatting to you because you've actually got like an actual story about genuine censorship that people in Australia, I don't think, have ever experienced. Yeah, I mean, the censorship thing is not, you know, I, I don't want to come out here like one blanket opinion about it. It's, it's clearly a complicated issue, right? But but my background with it living in China and, and, and having everything from like literally submitting scripts for TV that are to have Communist Party members going over them and and having people in shows writing down jokes and f- walking in with cameras and filming and getting shows shut down and all that sort of stuff and being marched into cultural bureau offices and asked to explain about stuff. You know, I definitely... It's funny because, you know, you hear some, let's say, for lack of a better expression, right-wing people being like, yeah, it's a slippery slope, you know, you give up this one word and then the rest of them will be gone soon kind of thing. But there's, there is a truth to it, you know, like, w- and I think China suffers from the fact that it's, it, it has made such a habit of giving up rights that when the current regime started to take away more rights, there was, the, the ship had already sailed. There was really nothing they could do about it. That's interesting. So you kind of do see there is some merit to the uh, slippery slope argument for want of a better I term. I think there's, you know, again, the... The other side to it's true is that some stuff sh- should be censored, but it's definitely, you know, once you start censoring stuff, it gets easier to censor more stuff. And and I think that comedy in some ways is a bit of a canary in the coal mine of of of, of rights and human rights and stuff like that. And Because I see in other countries I've worked in as well, like Malaysia, and you've got comedy clubs, you know, just recently, I don't know if you, you saw this, but there was a... <clears throat> there was a, a girl wearing a hijab. She took it off during an open mic. She was wearing a low cut top mm, in Kuala Lumpur. Underneath it, yeah, yeah. So they filmed it. It went viral. The comedy club's been shut down. The the owner of the comedy club's been arrested, and now he's being investigated and charged for other things like having the you know LGBT flag or branding on posters and stuff like that. Mm. Because it's an Islamic nation, obviously, and that would violate. Yeah, the and they there. also said he was, you know, he created a place where Muslims were uh, violating their principles and embracing Western values and drinking and all that sort of horrible stuff. And you know, if you look at Malaysia as an example, Malaysia in the nineties was a lot freer. It actually was. It, it's far worse now than it was then. Right. And what's happened is that religious folk have had a stronger hold on the government and then they've had more control and then they, they free speech. Speech is one of the first things that authoritarian regimes look at, start cutting it off. And, and again, like I said, comedy is this canary in the coal mine. You see the comedy starts to get its head lopped off and everyone's like, oh, who cares? They shouldn't have said that. That was a bad word. And it's like, well, look at the direction where everything else is going. Interesting. And what is this a symptom of? 
So to go back to, I guess, your story. So just for context, so you were living in Shanghai? Yeah. Is yeah. It, when did you move there? 2009. Right. July. And then uh, um, you started the first ever like English comedy club in Shanghai. Is that right? Yeah. So what prior to us, there'd been a couple of like people bringing through uh British comedians to play in like a British pub to a bunch of white expats. And sure. that, that happened once every six months or something. And they were pretty much mostly no-name comedians. And then a guy in Beijing who was from Boston, who, who was an open micer in Boston in the 80s, had all these contacts. And he brought through, at a time when they weren't famous, Jim Gaffigan, Russell Peters... And he was famous at this point, but Louis C.K. as well. I saw Louis C.K. play a Beijing temple. Oh, really? <laughs> and, like, it was the most surreal thing you've ever seen in your life. A it was temple. like, think, like, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. <laughs> 200 seats, maybe 150 seats. And full traditional, like, hundreds-year-old temple and Louis C.K. on stage. Why did they choose that venue? Was it the only, like, a, v- a venue that was suitable for a live performance? I think they just thought it was cool. Okay. You know, I don't know the conversation. I do know the, the the guy that booked it, but I never asked him. But, you know, maybe Louis said, hey, I want to play something iconic. I want to play, mm. you know, what can you get me? I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But but they, they could have played a regular theater. Yeah, right. Um, they just happened to choose that place and it was a phenomenal thing. You know, it was funny because this was before he was persona non grata. Um, and I'm not taking a position on that because of what I said about free speech. But um, at the time, he was, a, you know, an exciting act to see in comedy. There's no question about it. Mm. Right. And and there was rumors that he was in the city in Beijing. I was in Shanghai and people started messaging me saying, like, there's rumors that he might put a show on. And people are like, are you, is it you? Are you and me and my business partner are like... Who <laughs> could it be? <laughs> so we got on the phone and we figured it out. And then we went on the high speed train that day to Beijing. To Beijing. Yeah. Watched the show, stayed in a hotel, and came back the next day. Great. But that's what it was like back then, you know. So this guy from Boston set up like kind of a bit of a. Well, and we'd already been operating for a while at that point. But, right. But yeah. So the point I'm trying to make was that there was a couple of instances of people bringing in foreign acts, mm. but no one had ever done anything locally and no one had done anything on the scale that would that would follow. Yeah. So what we did that no one had done was we started running shows that were from people there, um, Chinese and foreigners. Um, and, and we started a scene and we started doing some shows and it grew and eventually we opened a club and then we, we started running shows in different cities. We did shows in, I think, 40 cities. Oh, wow. By the end of it. I, I remember because I did um, you had Kung Fu Kong, yeah, yeah. In, in Shanghai in 2016. Yeah. And something that I'll always remember is you said, oh, we're running this other show. It was like on a Wednesday night. I don't remember the name of the city, but you said, oh, it's just like a small city outside of Shanghai. And it was like 6 million people. Population 6 million. It's, it's bigger population than the country of Sweden. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's just like this like small little town outside it's of It's a water Shanghai. village. It's like- <laughs> and I remember like, yeah, we got on the high speed train and, and went there. It was a really fun show, I remember. They I were great remember- gigs, man. They were like, uh, if you like comedy and being on the road, that was like, that was a pretty hot time. Yeah, no, I remember like just being excited to be because I was doing a few gigs in Asia. Um, Shanghai was one of the gigs that I went to. But it's interesting how you mentioned, and we'll come back to the, your experience with the, the CCP later, because um, I was doing gigs around Asia at the time. And I remember I did a gig in, speaking of um, censorship, I did a gig in uh, Bangkok. Oh, yeah. Don't mention the king. So I did it like <laughs> a week after he died. Oh, wow. So it, originally the show was... Um, delayed. At which stage you had 20 minutes of material about it. <laughs> well, here's the thing because, uh, well, firstly, the show was postponed for like a couple of weeks because uh, he was dead and you couldn't do any. Um, they were in a period of mourning. Yeah. I mean, and then I, remember, I remember thinking at the time how how bizarre is this and how strange is it to have this, you know, defined period of mourning where you can't have any entertainment in the entire country and then literally the queen dies the other way yeah everyone's- you're like what a backwards <laughs> yeah. nation oh england's <laughs> got their they're quiet now Every, basically any country who would have thought that a country that has a monarchy might be a bit regressive but i thought it was um strange that first they had this period of mourning but then the club reopened and they said hey you can do the show now what was it comedy club bangkok yep i think that's what it was called bangkok comedy something like that yeah um, and it was a really fun show, 
I remember the guy saying to me, don't make jokes about the king. And I thought he was just like, haha, don't make jokes about the king. But he was like, and I was like, oh, that's fine. I've got like two jokes on him. And then he like pulled me aside and was like, no, do not make jokes about the king. Like you'll get arrested and we'll get arrested. So that, that was like my first time, I think, understanding that there was actual censorship. Do you know the story about that same promoter? No. Jonathan Atherton was given the same instruction. So Jonathan Atherton is another comedian who I think lived in Cambodia. He's passed from, away now. Now he yes. was living in Singapore and then and then KL. Okay. And then moved back to Australia and passed away. He was given the same instruction and he speaks Thai. And he got up and did a bit about the king being a ladyboy and then repeated it in Thai. And by the time the show finished, the cops were there. Oh, my God. Yeah. So someone at the venue, an, yeah, audience, yeah. an audience member presumably? Yeah, they, they called the cops, yeah. Oh, my God. And what happened to Jonathan and the club? Uh, I think there were fines. The club was shut down. Um, and this was a while ago. So, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. But it was a huge drama at the time. Yeah, wow. Definitely big problems. I mean, I've got so much material about the Queen's death. <laughs> I think I'd have to retire if I wasn't allowed to do those jokes. I just as soon as you tell me you can't do something, you can't talk about a particular topic. All I want to do is talk about that topic. You know, it's a funny thing because I think the real cultural differences are very subtle, and people say like, you know, China blocks the internet. Doesn't that make everyone want to look? You know, but mm. for some reason, Chinese people are like, no, oh, I guess I won't look. You know, don't people have? I remember. And I think in the West we would be like, I need to see the thing that you're hiding. Mm. Um, but I only discovered VPNs when I was in China. But, but most people don't use it. Most people don't use a VPN no, there. They no. just go with whatever they're given they're from like, the government. Correct. Interesting. So, well, so going back to your your comedy club, Kung Fu Comedy in yeah. Shanghai. So you set it up. What year did you like start running shows as Kung Fu Comedy there? So we did our first show, I think it was the end of 2010. Mm -hmm. And then... We started doing monthly shows after that and then we were doing open mics and after a while we started flying in international headliners and, you know, so it was really the end of 2010 it kicked off. And so how did you get on, I guess, the radar of the Chinese government? I mean, the as someone, <laughs> I remember when I, when, when I got the venue that you saw. Mm, it was a great venue. The landlord venue, like said to me, don't be too popular. Really? Yeah. As in like... If, They'll come looking. Right. So if, if you think... If you kind of were less successful, I guess... We would have been fun. You would have been okay. Because it was quite successful. It was a really great space. Yeah, it was, it was really always well. full. Yeah. yeah. And you had Chinese shows and English shows. And Chinese I, shows are huge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, like, and the, we, the, we played a role in kicking off this Chinese scene. I mean, you know, I think I was in the first... I used to tour and perform in Mandarin. Mm. And uh, I'm pretty sure I was in the first ever Mandarin stand-up show. Wow. Uh, and that is now a huge industry. It's massive. I mean, I've had people... I had a taxi driver here asking me about people that used to perform at our club. Like, wow. That started there. And there was a guy who was an open micer at the club. And I, two years later, he sold 16,000 tickets in an hour in Shanghai. Oh, know. my God. So who's this? Do I know no, they're Chinese. They're performing Chinese. Right. Okay. So they're these are Mandarin language comedians. Just, okay. Only and he only kind of performs in in China then. Yeah. Okay. You can't do English anymore in China. So you can't do English comedy in China. They've recently allowed Chinese people to do it again. Okay. But they don't let foreigners come in and perform no, in English. No. So yeah, tell me about what that was like when. Well, that, that's a recent rule though, the getting foreigners to come in to perform in English couple of years. Okay. Yeah. People I, are still I, doing it. I came in, in 2016 and... Yeah, I mean, that's performed in English six years I, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when the club got... When the club was shut down by the government, that was a real turning point. Right. And, and that so, was in, I think, uh, October 2018. So, what triggered, I guess, the government to shut down the club? Was there any an event or was it just... You will become so successful. The way it works in China is they will use this sort of the tide of, of, of political activity, right? So you've got throughout the year, there's certain congresses that happen and certain periods of time when things need to be shut down and local authorities don't want any trouble in their region. Um, and Xi Jinping was really just hammering down on society and he was hammering down on Shanghai. I, 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 he, 
it seems in my estimation that Xi Jinping really doesn't like Shanghai. Um, why is it that? Well, Shanghai a- is sort of, it's not a Western city, but mm. but to the eyes of the Chinese, it's a very Western influenced city and it's yeah. a city that Shanghainese are a very specific stereotype in China and they're depicted as being arrogant, money focused, materialistic and, and you know... Admire, like admire the of, West. Yeah. Yeah. They're the Sydney siders of yeah. China. <laughs> Just for our Australian yeah. audience. <laughs> and they go on uh, Bondi Beach. And no. They <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> yeah, it's not racist. That's actually beach. No. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm kidding. <laughs> but who's going to know? That's who's going to look that up? <laughs> Google in Chinese. That's the thing. Try, Anyone try Googling that, it. <laughs> I've had so much stuff over the last few years. You know, talk about, like, so I've said people say, that a, a white person learning Chinese is cultural appropriation. <laughs> that's pretty funny. And it's like, what, but if you don't speak it, who's the one that's being culturally understanding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just always sounds racist when a white person speaks Chinese. It's not. Well, it just depends how they speak it. <laughs> 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 but like, I was in China and I'm trying to, you know, participate and show some respect. So I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I always felt like, what's is this guy making fun of us? I was just trying to be polite and you know absorb the one culture. of the pieces of advice of i got in my first week that i was there someone said because it's very hard to be understood in chinese especially in the beginning because it's a different set of sounds and mm, got your mouth is used to it yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a tonal language which is difficult for we don't speak a tonal language you've got to learn that yeah and someone said to me listen man this will sound funny but just try to be really racist when you're speaking <laughs> And it's easy to be understood. And he's absolutely right. Right. And it's, he was joking, but the point is that you're almost mocking because you've got to really try you to sound commit. correct. You've got yeah. to commit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it can sound ridiculous. Yeah. But if you don't do it, people will literally not understand you. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to like lose all those. No one, if you're trying to speak Chinese in China, no one is like, this is racist. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I think that's really funny. The fact and that I, people wouldn't pick up if I was like me, how <laughs> like people wouldn't pick up on that. They might think I'm speaking a little odd, but they just think I'm trying. I have an accent. Yes. I don't, I'm not a native speaker. Yes. So it's 2018, and Xi Jinping is cracking down on things in Shanghai. Yeah. Anything? In, anything in particular? So, so what happened was there was. Uh, I think it's an annual thing now, but he was introducing this big trades fair and it was a big deal. I don't know, like Obama, I think was in town. It was top level leaders were coming into the city and whenever that happens, whenever you have like a Putin's in town or whoever's in town, that whole area will get shut down. They'll shut down their bars. They'll shut down like... Is it true that they shut down like the factories for a couple of days to clear the smog Absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. And that was, there's a... Drew Fralick, who I think you might have met, he, or maybe you didn't, he had a great bit where he, he described the different tones of the, the sky and the, the best was G20 blue. <laughs> And That's he's so like, funny. when you go to the metro, and normally there's a guy with a handgun, maybe there's a guy with a shotgun. He's like, when they got the AK-47 in the metro, yeah. it's going to be blue skies today. <laughs> Do you know what? Maybe it's that bit that taught me that about Shanghai. It's a great it rings bit. A, it rings a bell. It's a great bit. Yeah. It's one of those bits that makes you think totally differently about, you know. About comedy in the place that, you're well, in. that connection. So, yeah. So, they would because sh- they're obviously trying to put on a, a good show for the international ambassadors and, and visitors. Like, we don't have pollution. <laughs> and then the other thing is like when they turn them back on, they got to make up for lost be- time. <laughs> so so double- like afterwards, it's like black skies. <laughs> you know, just walk around with soot on their face like, on, a, dude, like a Charles seen, Dickens chimney sweep. <laughs> you know, I don't know what the AQI in Australia is like 25 or something. You know, I've been there when it's like 800 oh and you literally, I can hear myself wheezing just walking down the street. And just, you, do you have to wear a mask? Do people wear masks? They do in that situation, yeah. But I, I, I don't. You've got to have a certain type of mask to actually block out the particulate, right? P two point five or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people put on surgical masks, but the air is you're breathing in. That's not blocking. Doesn't anything. make the difference. Yeah. I'm not, that's now not, that's like, not like a masks. mask theory, right? <laughs> but it is actually... Also, COVID isn't real. That's, that's science. <laughs> that one's actually science. You look it up. Can I just say though, we do make fun of that policy of shutting down the factories for like two weeks when foreigners come. But then when Australia had, I think, the Commonwealth Games or 
at any major sporting event, we like just push the homeless off the streets for a couple of weeks. Yeah. So, you know, I think every country does it to some extent. Okay, so two funny things about that. Num- uh, number one, they also set off ex- uh, warheads in the air because it makes the rain clo- clouds go away. So they'll clear the clouds out as well. Like it's legitimately blue skies. It's always, it's always sunny in Shanghai. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Oh my god, they blow up the sky. Yeah, well, you don't see the explosions, but that's it's known that that's how they do it. Oh my god. And then uh, oh, I can't remember what I was going to say. There's something else about it. Oh, it's gone away from me. It'll come back. But okay, yeah. well, if you remember, let me know because I'd like to know how else they're blowing up the clouds. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just a bit. Of, it's it's the shooting. There's just people at AK-47s just, just, on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> just, the just, cloud hasn't moved. Just keep going. Keep going. Maybe get we're a bigger a, gun. We're sending a message to the other clouds. Yeah. This. So it's so going back to Xi Jinping cracking down on things in Shanghai. Yeah. So when did you first realize that you had uh, raised the ire of the Chinese government? Uh it was a very gradual process. And, and, and I think that there was always the risk of the Chinese government and then there was the Xi Jinping regime. That was a big d- different situation. We were in trouble. We, we'd gotten in trouble before that happened. Mm. You know, early on, when you move into, when you start doing shows in a new district, generally what I found is that if once you were in a district and the local authorities realized that you weren't making any trouble, they didn't care because we, were, we weren't any trouble. You know, but when you went into a new district for the first time, that's when your cops might sniff around or the culture bureau and just be like, what's going on here? Like, right. what is this? And I remember we had, we were in Suzhou, which is a water town of 6 million people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adjacent to... The little backwater, yeah. Shanghai, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and You can drive through it in only four and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, no, no way. That'll get you a block. <laughs> There was a, a place called the Bookworm that had three locations across China and it was an iconic book venue that did a lot of um, literary festivals and stuff like that and they brought a lot of interesting speakers in and, and so they had a history of getting raided in trouble. Right. So we tried to do a show with them and they got raided hours before our first show. Right. This was outside of Shanghai. It was in Suzhou. Yeah. yeah. That was the fir- my first taste of like, we're not in Kansas. Like, right. We need, to be, we need to be careful about what we're doing. So because you were performing in a venue that was already kind of on a list somewhere, that's when you kind yeah, of... Yeah, well, I guess maybe they were keeping an eye on it and they saw something that they were like, what's this? There's something, right. They're doing something different. And so we moved the show to some basement around the corner and halfway through the show, we realized there were two guys sitting there writing all the jokes down. Wow. So, two guys from the government. Culture Bureau, yeah. Right. So, they weren't stealing jokes. <laughs> they were there to record the jokes. Well, you know, there's that famous story about Lenny Bruce where he's in court and the police officer's reading out his jokes and the judge says, did you say this? He goes, well, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a pause. People were laughing when I said it. <laughs> you kind of had to be there, you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> Can't just verbatim recount it. So that's when uh, you noticed for the first time that there were some government officials at a yeah, show you of yours. Run into trouble, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, so what? You then you continue to run shows in Shanghai. We kept going in Suzhou, and we ended up going to the Bookworm. We had a long history at the Bookworm in Suzhou, Beijing, and also Chengdu. But but that was the first time where I was like, okay. Would you give comedians? Um, instructions beforehand like so, i was told not to make jokes about the king of thailand would you say to comedians don't make fun of the so, government so generally the rule at the time was the three t's don't talk about tiananmen taiwan or uh tibet cool unless um, you're saying tiananmen didn't happen and taiwan and tibet are yeah. parts of china well you know the irony about this is like that's what comics would say they're like but what if my bit is pro colonizing Tibet. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, they don't want you to talk about it at all. (laughs) (laughs) They don't want you to mention it. They're not like, oh, this guy's going to help us make our case. They like don't want it brought up. Right. They just don't want it even discussed. But but what we discovered is that people didn't have material about these things until you told them. Yeah. And so we wouldn't tell people because because that was a better strategy to get comics to not talk about it. I understand. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, like I said, if you told me not to do it, then I'd really want to do it. Although that blew, blew up in my face a little bit when I was had, had Gab Elmale at the Shanghai Centre. Mm. Thousand people, big show. Yeah. Fully permanent show, like a fully big, big deal. Was he performing in English, I presume? He was. Yeah. Yeah. And then he just 
decided to talk about the Dalai Lama for 10 minutes and everyone in the, we were all just like famously from Tibet. oh god <laughs> <laughs> this is you didn't tell him did you I'm like I didn't tell him I didn't know he was going to bring it up you know how did the crowd react does the crowd get tens because is the crowd thinking we better not laugh because they, then we could be they implicit they usually do but for whatever reason they didn't that night and I don't know why that is you know okay they, I, had an, I had another one with Eddie Izzard who they had to submit scripts. That's the other thing with the big shows is mm. we knew that they weren't going to talk about this stuff because they submitted the script. Right. Until they add something later on. Right. Right. And so Izzard is pretty committed to his set show. Mm. And he had a bit about monks self-immolating. And we're like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> that, and they were the, his manager, tour manager was like, I think we'll cause more trouble. We're going to freak him out. But they were just watching the show. And I, th- I think they realized he was still doing it that week. And they were like, all right, we'll just talk to him and get him to drop it. Okay. Interesting. So tell me, so at what point did I guess things come to a head in in Shanghai for you? Well, I mean, I kind of had a sense that I was in a dangerous situation in 2017. And I was like, you know, I had a kid and I was running this tiny comedy club. I'm owning it by myself pretty much. And I was like, this is, I'm going to end up with nothing. Mm. In a, so so, so I, I ended up selling the comedy club at that point and continuing to work for the person, the people that bought it. Okay. Was that a way of you like kind of protecting yourself, not having it in your name? Well, to be fair to myself, I did think that a, a larger entity would be better at keeping it alive. Because mm-hmm. the problem for me was I didn't have enough money that if, if we got shut down for a month, that I might just have to stop. Yeah. Right? But it, but a bigger entity that was doing other business with the Culture Bureau might be able to get things reopened faster. They had to have the bank, the pockets to deal with, you know, a period of getting shut down. Sure. And, and up until that point in China, it really was, with the, we also call it like the pendulum. It's like stuff can get tight and difficult yeah. and clamp down, but it swings back. Yeah. And you, you always sort of hunker down and get through a period like that. Mm. Whether it's a, you know, another changing of the president, or there's some sort of a congress on, or whatever, there's just stuff like that happening every now and then, and it'll mm. tighten up, and then it, and then afterwards it's loose again, right? Yeah. So I was like, a big company is going to be able to get through that better than me. Yeah. Um, but Xi Jinping changed all of that. So what did he? The pendulum didn't swing back. It stayed oh, it just... tight, and it kept getting tighter, and it has continued to get tighter ever since for the last five years. Wow. Because, yeah, you do hear about how he's trying to consolidate power and things are becoming more restricted for people in China. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So, this entity that you sold the business to, they eventually got... The government came in to a show one night and filmed everyone and took names down and shut the venue down. My Lord. And then a month later, they let a Chinese group open up in the same venue. A Chinese group that was running comedy shows? Running Chinese language comedy shows. Right. Okay. And I presume they're running, you know, shows that are very, very highly vetted, I would have thought, by the by the bureau. Yeah. It, it, that, that's a whole nother conversation. Mm. Yeah. They, the groups that run the shows there have huge leverage and, and long, close relationships with the culture bureaus. and. Mm. I think they're theoretically every open mic is supposed to have scripts submitted and approved. Wow. Uh, Imagine but, having to submit your scripts as an open mic comedian. I mean, no one wants to read this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for the people in yeah. that bureau yeah. having to read the worst comedy. <laughs> Translated as well. Um, hor- horrific. Yeah. But um, So I was on the bus the other day and yeah. then I shat my pants. <laughs> like, and I was like, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're probably reading going, this is actually very good. <laughs> yeah, he's like, it's the best material I've had. <laughs> I was in Can Tib- I get tickets? Okay. I was in Tibet the other day. Yeah. I was like, Dad. Boy, is this hot because I'm on fire right now. <laughs> but at least the sky is You can clear. tell I don't live there anymore, by yeah. the way. <laughs> so I'm actually really... Because I would be sweating bullets by now. <laughs> so I was really happy that you're happy to talk about this. Yeah. Because you do hear a lot about people still being concerned about repercussions from the Chinese government, even when they're not in China anymore. Yeah, it depends what you're doing. If you've still got business over there, mm. you know, I don't really, 
Maybe I do, but not really. It's just, I, I don't know. I feel a, a duty to be vocal about it because everyone is so complicit in the censorship that that's what allows it to thrive. Right. Know? It's the complicity of the population, you're saying. Correct. Interesting. At the end of the day, the people of China could rise up and throw out Xi Jinping, but they don't. I mean, there's a billion of them. They could take them. Absolutely. And Just the number the one risk to any government anywhere is civil unrest. Number mm. one risk is civil unrest. Did you notice any civil unrest when you were in China? Uh, not really. You know, you know Muhammad Magdi, the Egyptian comedian. So, he yes. was... He was evicted out of Egypt during the Mubarak revolution. Yes. And he made a really interesting point when we were in Hong Kong, because we were living in Hong Kong together. And during Hong Kong, we saw this transition as people really started to be more amenable to the Communist Party and China, Chinese rule. Not everyone, but more and more people. And he made this point where he was like, you know what? When people see the inevitability of power, they're on board. They'll they'll find a way to justify supporting who is inevitably going to be on pa- pa- in power. Not everyone, but but plenty of people are like that. So and a, I think a lot that, of people as in, they kind of like see the writing on the wall. Correct. And they just align Why themselves. Why oppose a government that you absolutely cannot oppose? Yeah. Interesting. And so you think a lot of people in China are like that? Yeah. And, you know, the other side to it is they don't, they, they don't have a sub stack they can access that's telling them that everything they're hearing is rubbish. You know, mm. the, 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 they're obviously getting controlled information, which is a problem Yeah, for them having insight. But, you know, people realize that you can really mess your life up talking out against the government. So why not be really pro-government? But, but you know, there's, there's a lot of odd stuff happening here with people being kept tab on and checked up on. And, 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 and I know a lot of... I know people here who get calls in the middle of the night from international numbers. Wow. From Chinese security asking what they're doing. Right. I get calls from people speaking Chinese, but it's that, usually that tax it's office just, scam. It's, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get my number? No, it's you answer the call and it's you know, a lady speaking Chinese. And then I find out later, oh, it's a scam but they just called numbers randomly and hopefully you speak Chinese and you think yeah. it's the Chinese government demanding tax from you. You know, there was a lot of scam calling when I was in China, when I was learning Chinese. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, this is a free lesson. <laughs> and I would just chat to them. You're like being super racist on the I, phone. My, my <laughs> vocabulary surrounding scams is like pretty robust. <laughs> I can spot a Bitcoin pyramid scheme a mile away. Yeah, no, they'd be like, yeah, you, you, you forgot to transfer. Hey, it's me. Lee Wong, if you got to transfer me the money, I'm like, Lee, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long. Um, mate, thank you so much for like sharing this story. I just think it's so fascinating and I think it's always, it's very timely as well. Um, we have a huge following in China. Huge numbers. You do. Huge. Numbers are huge. Huge market. Do you have a message to the people of China? <laughs> To close out the podcast. Uh, I think China's great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If you're listening, uh, there is a man standing behind Andy holding an AK-47 as he speaks. Ready to sterilize me. (laughs) No, no, but I I do... If there was one message that I do want to convey to people is that... Because the problem is this synecdoche, right? There's this the conflation of what China means. Is it the government? Is it the country? Is it the people? And Mm. the government's very good at making those three concepts the same thing. Yes. So when you talk negatively about the party, people think he's talking negatively about me. Yes. And that's not ever what I'm saying. Yeah, it's the government that we don't like. Chinese people are... I was very grateful for the many years I had living there and it was a beautiful time for me and... And I, you know, my criticisms of the Communist Party are limited to the Communist Party. Mm. That's that's a point that I always want to make clearly. Cool. And if they let you back in, would you take it? No. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> I don't trust them just yet. No. Nah. Um, well, let's end with um, Free Tibet. And uh, Tiananmen Definitely, did. you're, you're, you're <laughs> preaching preach the choir there. <laughs> Taiwan is not a province. Absolutely a country. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, mate. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. <laughs>